So yesterday, over dinner, Thibault said that we shouldn't heap too much praise on him, but um, I just cannot avoid it. It's unavoidable. Uh, you can just measure the depth and breadth of his contributions if you look at the conference program. Um, but there's also another Thibault, and that's the Thibault I've learned to. I've got to know over 20 years of collaboration and interaction, and it's a sort of, should I say, non-physics Thibault. And uh, I've, just, uh, I've just put up three things here. Uh, th this was already mentioned, this prize-winning comic book, uh, which, which is really ingenious, I must say. It's probably the best popular introduction to quantum mechanics that I, that I know of and have ever seen. Um, then there's this. This was only touched upon in Pierre's introduction. Uh, at least I saw something, it looked like a picture of Einstein next to a picture of Proust. And um, Thibault, as far as I know, is also an expert on Marcel Proust. Uh, and actually, you, this, is, this is a copy of a book you gave me as a present uh, some years ago, just to tickle my interest in, in Marcel Proust. And uh, now this thing has been sitting on my die table for many years, <laughs> uh, because Proust, as you know, it's 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 formidable. We had yesterday we had the discussion of the meaning of the word formidable, um, but the situation has changed a little bit because at the beginning of this year, on my local radio station in Berlin, they're now reading all of Proust from beginning to end, 50 sessions of 40 minutes yeah, each. Huh? In German, yes, of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, but but the thing that really uh, sort of got me really excited is they have a feature that comes uh, uh, every Monday, a quarter past seven, and it's called it's called Lust und Frust mit Brust. <laughs> Uh, and this is a young lady. It, she does it brilliantly. She picks out certain aspects of of Proust and then uh, dissects them in a way that really makes uh, the thing much more accessible than if you just try to read it. And this, you know, also reminded me of discussions we had about the word lust, because you kept asking me in connection with uh, Rilke's epitaph, because also the word lust appears. And then, you know, we had discussions on how to best translate this into French. Uh, so anyway, so this is another inspiration I got from uh, Thibault over the years. And of course, there's also music. I just remember that you were practicing Die Winterreise, I guess, with Hugo Moschella, uh, Quatre Mains. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's another summit of Western culture. Okay, let's now pass to physics. Um, so first I want to tell you how what brought us together. And uh, what brought us together is actually a stunning insight by our chairman, Bernard Julia, who uh, had this conjecture in connection with maximal supergravity, where they discovered the emergence of um, exceptional symmetries in, gra in supergravity. And then he had this daring conjecture, this is almost 40 years ago, uh, that there would emerge something called E10 symmetry in the reduction of this theory to one dimension. Uh, now over the years, uh, we have learned a little bit more. And uh, the, the way I would pose it now is the question is, is this really the symmetry underlying M theory, this hypothetical, uh, mythical, unified, uh, non perturbative unification of string theory. In which case, you would have an infinite increase in the hidden symmetries of these theories and the unification of matter and gravitational degrees of freedom into a single, you know, monstrously large duality symmetry. So, uh, actually, I was hooked. Uh, on this idea from the very beginning. But so in, 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 uh, I think it was about 2000, I came to Paris and gave a talk and Thibault was sitting in the audience. And afterwards he got to me that, yeah, got up and said, yeah, why don't we start discussing this? And so we did. And then uh, together with Marc Henault, we started working on, well, something called 
e10 over k10 sigma model, never mind what it is. Um, not worrying too much about what e10 really is. And now after 20 years I have to say we still have no idea what it is. And uh, not as anyone else. And uh, this was the other thing you said, not too much praise. Let's have a look towards the future and you know the problems that are still open. Now here's a real problem, open problem, namely to understand what this is. As uh, Igor Frankel always emphasizes, to me he says this is deepest mathematics. So it may take another, you know, we, we have to calculate in decades here really for progress. Anyway, over the years the investigation revealed a number of really nice uh, things, among other things. Maybe first of all a crucial link with the BKL analysis of cosmological singularities, actually a fascinating link. And with this, with this sigma model, actually a concrete proposal of what M-theory really should be. Because you hear, these days you hear a lot of people talking about M-theory, but never telling you what it really is. Much less give us some kind of formula that would encapsulate M-theory. And then there were many, many further results that also could, together with Axel Kleinschmidt, who is also here. So I will just, uh, because time is short, I will just touch on some aspects of this without being complete. And the intention of my talk is less to, to emphasize finished work, because there's hardly any finished work here, but rather to emphasize what we don't know, a huge level of ignorance that's still there. So uh, I've already mentioned BKL. So this is uh, one aspect I want to illuminate. Uh, and I guess that uh, Mark, Mark will also talk about, about this. Where's Mark? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you will talk about it. So I'll, I, with uh, some things I'll be a little, um, uh, I'll pass over rather quickly. Anyway, the, the core of the BKL ansatz can be encapsulated in this, this Kasner metric because the statement is, as you approach, this is about the general be generic behavior of Einstein's Solutions. The idea here is as you, have the, as you approach space-like singularities, there's a sort of generic behavior which was analyzed by first by Belinsky, Halaptikov, Lifshitz, one of the great discoveries of mathematical cosmology of the last 50 years. And uh, the statement is somehow the main action takes place in the diagonal uh, phase factors, uh, scale factors, which you see in this ansatz, which is just the Kasner metric. And when you substitute this ansatz into the Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, this is what you get. Uh, it's just a free relativistic particle in a massless uh, particle in, uh, in this beta space, not in real space, but in this beta space of logarithmic uh, scale factors. And when you translate it into Hamiltonian, uh, it's just a statement that p squared equals zero. This is something uh, well known from elementary quantum field theory. Now the crucial thing, is, or one crucial observation, is that the metric that you get from this action is first of all Lorentzian, that's one of its crucial famous features, uh, but later, and this is the connection with uh, E10, it turns out that this De Witt metric coincides with the cartan killing metric of some indefinite Katz-Moody algebra when you restrict it to the cartan sap algebra and then you identify the cartan sap algebra actually with these scale factors. Uh, indefinite is important here because this follows from the indefiniteness of the De Witt metric. So that's an essential feature which, which comes from gravity. Now, uh, it, it has turned out to be um, convenient to describe the motion, this relativistic motion, which in beta space is just a straight motion on uh, null lines in the say, forward light cone. It's, it's, it's uh, convenient to project this motion onto the unit hyperboloid in the forward light cone by means of this, uh, this projection here. So we have uh, coordinates, uh, beta. I, I should say that most of my talk will be uh, for E10. That means 11-dimensional supergravity, which means 10 of these uh, scale factors. So we now project these uh, 10 uh, vectors onto a nine-dimensional unit hyperboloid. 
And then there's this rho, uh, which is simply the length of this uh, vector beta, and the omega parameter is the unit hyperbolic. And it proves convenient to choose coordinates or the lapse function in such, such a way that the distance between epsilon and t equals epsilon, t equals zero, the singularity, is blown up to infinity. So this is why we call this zeno time. So the singularity in this coordination is reached for rho to infinity. Now, the effect of uh, the matter degrees of freedom is, of course, very complicated. But there's a crucial simplification, the BKL limit, uh, which you can study by, uh, well, this is the language of high energy physics, integrating out matter, off-diagonal, curvature, and so on, degrees of freedom. At the end of the day, this free motion, relativistic motion, is modified by potential. And in the limit towards the singularity, these potentials become sharp walls, so that as a result, this particle moves on light-like lines and bounces off the walls of this chamber, uh, which is formed by, the, uh, by these sharp walls. Uh, so that's a very nice description of uh, the BKL uh, situation. In, and it's sort of universal, applies to all dimensions and various types of meta couplings, supergravity, what, what have you. But now we want to immediately go to the quantum theory. Now quantization is simply replacement of uh, momenta by d by dx, and uh, the constraint is replaced by the well, Klein-Gordon equation. So this is what this is. Uh, um, and then uh, uh, what you get is the so-called Wheeler-DeWitt equation. It, it's really like the Klein-Gordon equation, except that this h operator now acts in this beta space of scale factors. And if you now... Uh, uh, decompose the coordinates in the way I've shown before, then the, this d'Alembert operator has a sort of, uh, he has this piece, and then he has a piece depending on the Laplace-Beltrami operator on the unit hyperboloid. So you see that uh, rho is really this, this radial chord is really like a time, and this is a well-known mechanism in how to extract time out of the timeless Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Wheeler the equation constraint to start with has no time, but this is how you get time out of it by taking one of the degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is work we did like 11 years ago with Axel and uh, my PhD students, uh, Michael Kühn. So let's assume that uh, we uh, diagonalize this. So first of all, we factorize, separate the wa wave equation, and then um, it's, it's uh, an elementary exercise to work out, once you know this eigenvalue, uh, what the wave function looks like, or the radial part of the wave function. It looks like this. So it all depends on what, the, what these eigenvalues are. Now there's a nice trick to derive an inequality on this, uh, which I don't go through in all detail. It involve, involves directly boundary condition, it involves um, uh, using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, uh, and the, at the end of the calculation, you get this inequality, where d is the uh, n uh, number of um, uh, spatial dimensions. So d would be 3 for Einstein gravity in four dimensions, and uh, 10 for 11-dimensional um, for supergravity. Now you see that this is just, just the combination that appears here. Uh, so what you see here, because d is greater than 2, uh, you have uh, the, the wave function decays and otherwise oscillates. And this inequality ensures that what's on the square root here is positive. So, so this, is, this is really, you know, if it were negative, then you might get another i and then it might destroy this behavior. But the universal behavior is here like this. It goes to 0 and then it also oscillates an infinite number of times as you go towards the singularity um, as long as this is positive and depending on what the energy eigenvalue is. So this means that generically in this approach the wave function vanishes at the singularity. And this is already, there are already three physically important things that you can deduce from that. Because first of all, this is De Witt's original proposed mechanism for resolving classical singularities in quantum gravity. 
he had this idea that if you solve the wave function for the wave function of the universe, uh, the, uh, it might have zero support on singular uh, three geometries. So this is actually borne out by this example. Furthermore, you're forced to a complex wave function. And uh, this is another question. The wheeler de Witt equation start with as a real equation. So why should you, you know, where do you get complexity from? Here it's forced to be complex, and uh, in this way you create an error of time which was not there to, be to start with. And finally, because the singularity, the black hole singularity is the time reverse picture of the Big Bang singularity, this could also be relevant for the resolution of the black hole information paradox. This is a recent paper of Malcolm Perry. Uh, now it can be a little more specific about this wave function because we have the walls, but the walls that reflect, in this case, the, the effect of this is that the wave function has to vanish at, this, uh, at, this, uh, at, the, at these walls. And uh, uh, so um, furthermore, because the walls are sort of identified or determined by the, the weil reflections of this underlying Katsmudi um, of the wild group associated with this underlying Katsmudi algebra. So you just have to impose these boundary conditions with a minor sign if you want directly boundary conditions. Now for E10, that's M theory. So D minus one is equal to nine. So we have to coordinate the unit hyperboloid and we do it in such a way that this is like the upper half plane, U plus IV, which is what it would be in the case of Einstein gravity. But because we are in nine dimensions, this is now what we call an octonionic upper half plane. So this is an octonion. Um, and with this, you, lead, you, you can realize the Weyl group in a sort of modular way, which this is completely analogous to, uh, to the modular realization of, uh, uh, for, for Einstein theory, which is just, in the, which case, you just have the usual modular group. And, uh, an important fact here is that these are the units, simple roots in E8. And here we exploit the fact that the E8 root lattice can be endowed with the structure of a non-commutative and non-associative ring. And uh, these integers, these are octonionic integers, quote unquote, called octavians. And then the E8 roots are simply the units of this ring. And in this way, you get a sort of completely modular uh, realization of the Weyl group of E8, and which means that actually the wave function of the universe is a modular, kind of modular form, but now with respect to this uh, generalized uh, modular group. Now, here's another problem for the future. Uh, a proper theory of monomorphic forms for this kind of group remains to be developed. These results actually can be super symmetrized. This is an extremely simple uh, uh, truncation of the theory, but they're already with the fermions, you get into trouble because the fermion the Fox space has two to the 160 components, even for this utterly simple truncation. There's also work related by, by uh, Thibault and uh, Spadel, which provides further evidence for these structures, but in ordinary Einstein gravity. Now, uh, okay, so the BKL story is very nice, uh, but uh, actually if one thinks about embedding gravity into this huge structure, you also have to worry about other degrees of freedom. And this is actually taken an argument taken from a paper I wrote with Thibault back in 2005, which was really about higher order corrections in M theory and how they related to E10. Uh, this thing is just in an appendix, but I now think this may possibly be the more important insight in this paper. Namely, formally proceeding, we take this infinite dimensional coset manifold, we formulate the geodesic uh, deviation equation, which is, you can look up in Weinberg's book, for example. So xi describes some geodesic, which you take to be in the Cartan subalgebra, so it's just straight line. And then delta xi is the deviation, and the de 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 this deviation equation describes the divergence of two geodesics as a function of the Riemann tensor. This is this what this equation says. So you evaluate this uh, for this 
huge coset. And then you have to label these directions of, uh, of the indices of the Riemann tensor, of which, of course, there are infinitely many. Uh, so we pick just a particular one associated with uh, some root. There are also root multiplicity to worry about, but never mind. But first of all, it's negative. OK, this is a hyperbolic manifold, so uh, that's OK. But the, the important point is that this can be made as negative as you like. And this has to do with the presence of so-called imaginary roots in E10. And one th result about imaginary roots is that uh, you, uh, any multiple of such a root is again a root. So you, by simply multiplying the root by n, any integer, you get another root, which means you get a factor of n squared here, which means that the geodesic equation has this n squared here, and then it will just uh, deviate exponentially. And no matter how small you choose the initial delta xi to be, 10 to the minus uh, 100,000 or whatever, you can always pick an n large enough so that this is deviates. So this suggests that the analysis for the BKL analysis, close to the singularity, where you just restrict to diagonal degrees of freedom, is, is sort of fails in this, in this much, much bigger uh, context. It suggests that the analysis cannot be confined to diagonal metrics, but then one must take into account all the uh, off-diagonal degrees of freedom. So now we go into the realm of speculation, because uh, then you ask yourself, OK, I showed you this, this Klein-Gordon equation for the diagonal scale factors, which gave rise to these automorphic forms. Uh, and yes, we have more on this, and uh, that's already in the early work, um, because we many years ago we showed that the bosonic Hamiltonian of, or at least part of it, the 11-dimensional supergravity theory, alias M theory, and the E10 Casimir agree up to level L equals 3. I, could exp I can explain what level means, but let's not stop here. It's just a sort of way to probe, uh, to, to probe into E10. Um, and this is a very non-trivial agreement, actually. It's, it's, it tells you that E10 somehow knows everything about maximal supergravity. Um, and then this simply suggests, ah, why don't we simply generalize the wave function the equation uh, in this way, where now the box is something you know, much, much, much bigger. Namely, the box is the E10 Casimir. Now, E10 Casimir exists. You can read in Victor Katz's book. It's a unique expression, and it's written here. Here, where you have the Cartan subalgebra, this is the Weyl vector, and here you have the sum of all the uh, raising generators, uh, normal ordered, if you like, because it's summing over post positive roots. Um, this is unique. There's a unique expression for this. Uh, and now the point is that actually, in this realization that we have, you can, in principle at least, represent these uh, generators by differential operators that act on the degrees of freedom of diagonal and so on. Um, uh, now, this is a calculation where we'll get stuck after a few steps, because with each step, it gets more complicated. It never stops getting more complicated. So these are, this is not you know, hardly a Gedanken calculation. But anyway, you can do this. And at low levels, uh, you will. Uh, what you get is a kind of Wheeler De Witt operator for 11 dimensional supergravity. It coincides with this. Uh, and furthermore, by this prescription, it will give you a definite ordering prescription. This is another problem with the Wheeler De Witt equation that uh, uh, people don't know. Uh, there's no unique ordering, but, but here it is. It's, it's there. So this is a nice feature. However, unfortunately, this cannot be the whole story because, first of all, uh, beyond, the matching works perfectly up to this level 3, gives you all of 11 dimensional supergravity, Wheeler De Witt, but beyond, it just stops, it just, just uh, disagrees, so there's no way, we haven't found in 20 years a way to fix this. Uh, so that's already a first indication. Secondly, indication is that this doesn't include the fermions, fermions are a crucial part of the story. Um, so uh, that's another thing. And finally, 
you know, suppose it were true, uh, this, this Casimir operator is well defined on highest weight or lowest weight representations. Um, and there you can evaluate it, it's a finite number. Uh, but then again, you know that if the Casimir is zero, then you expect the representation to be trivial, so that's nothing left. So the other possibility is that it's not a highest weight representation, but then you can, you know, we have kind of convinced ourselves that this expression no longer makes sense. So it's ill-defined. So yeah, it's sort of between Schiller and Charybdis, there's no, we have to, you know, one, uh, two bad options. So anyways, this is not a, a complete story. And uh, this is something we've been, you know, thinking about for a long time. And uh, we now think um, that um, that one will have to un better understand the fermions because this is something I've learned over many years of working in supergravity. Uh, that no matter what the problem what the problem is, it's always easier to analyze if you look at the fermions. Basically, because fermions obey linear equations of motion, whereas uh, um, bosons quadratic. So, for example, if you know this whole story about consistent truncations in kaluza klein theory was finally only solved uh, because we, we first did it for the fermion sector. For the bosons, it's usually much more complicated. So we've been looking at the fermions, uh, spending uh, most of our time now understanding fermions. They don't transform under E10, but under its compact subgroup, which is equally difficult to understand. But there's this curious feature that only, so far we only know finite dimensional unfaithful representations. And these are the ones that are inherited from supergravity. So we showed that they can actually implement it as representation of the full KE10. Uh, but this is as much as we know. With Axel we found two more that are beyond supergravity. And recently, actually, there's, there's been uh, some progress, at least with uh, Axel, uh, Ralf Köhl, and Robin Lautenbacher. This is this, this paper here, because we now, f at least for the affine case, we now infinitely many such representations. We've actually, I think, we've understood the raison d'être for the existence of these unfaithful representations. We've shown that they can be made arbitrarily big. And this, I think, is also important with regard to understanding E10, because th the thing that mathematicians have tried uh, look, to me at least, hopeless. But this is a completely different way of thinking about it, where you exhaust this group uh, by larger and larger and larger groups, where all the KE10 transformations are realized, but unfaithful. Um, so maybe there's a way to construct it as a limit. Um, but there's another idea here, which, uh, which you know, has been on my head for a long time. Maybe, maybe we may need to um, bosonize the, the fermions because, well, there's some hint from old work by Goddard, Naam, Olive from 1984, where they show that fermions in the 128 can be bosonized into 120 bosons. It's a non-abelian bosonization. So if you take the multiplet of maximal supergravity 128s plus 128c, two conjugate spinner representation, replace one by the adjoint then of s of the k of the k of e8, which is SO16, then you get the adjoint of e8. So you might expect there's a similar mechanism for a k10 at work. And if this is true, then um, then uh, something like what I showed on the previous transparency might still be true at the end of the day, but in a way that we, you know, at the moment have no idea how it, how it could possibly work. So, uh, let me conclude. Uh, there are now many, many, I think also, first of all, there's the mathematics, which is, as, as, as Igor said, uh, deepest mathematics, but there's also physics questions here, namely, first of all, can a sensible wheeler to wit operator be defined for E10? Is, and this is a, an idea that was first uh, put forward by Henri Ganor, is Psi then a kind of generalized modular form, but you know, vastly, hugely generalized, 
with respect to something like E10 over the integers, whatever. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is also a question. I, I argue that the geodesics restricted to BKL are unstable. And you have the same question. I mean, does the wave function close to the singularity necessarily involve all off-diagonal degrees of freedom as you get closer to the singularity? In which case, you know, there's a diffusion, quote unquote, into huge phase space as you approach the singularity. And as I said, this may have you know, give, give an entirely new twist this whole black hole information problem, uh, as argued by Malcolm Perry, uh, because if maybe information doesn't get lost if it doesn't get, get crushed in the singularity, but you know, if it diffuses into this huge phase space, it maybe cannot be recovered. Also, the question is, does, and this is actually what we've been discussing with Axel, does the wave function continue to vanish at the singularity with and uh, explain it, well, uh, there's a beautiful book by Axel and friends called Eisenstein's Series in Automorphic Representations, just for ordinary automorphic forms. And uh, there, indeed, it's true that the wave function decays exponentially in these off-diagonal directions. So here's the final question that I've written, published a CQG note just a few <coughs> months ago on this. Uh, the question is, is life at the singularity infinitely simple or infinitely complex? Uh, much of current work on quantum cosmology makes this assumption that life is infinitely simple. You just have a few variables, the uh, scale, scale factor, spatially homogeneous scalar fields, and then you'd solve uh, some partial differential equation. But what also happen is precisely the opposite. This is actually what I argue here. That uh, you know, as you try to get closer to the singularity, it becomes more and more and more uh, complex. So to summarize, there's a vast terra incognita out there waiting to be discovered and explored. Um, and you know, we have had wonderful time together. <laughs> I still hope that we're not too old to sort of take up some of these questions in in the not too distant future. So let me conclude with a few more pictures. Um, in 2005, uh, my wife here and I went to Bern for the Einstein centenary to meet with uh, Thibault, and then we went on this, on what we call an Einstein pilgrimage, visiting all the places that Einstein had been in, to in Bern. And here you see us sitting, actually like schoolboys, in Einstein's living room, reconstructed, of course, but you see nice pictures of. Uh, Mileva and the children and so on. Uh, this picture was taken three years ago in um, in Valdemosa in um, Mallorca. You were at my ERC kick uh, kick off uh, workshop, um, and while this this is a nice monastery where Frédéric Chopin spent an unhappy winter. It's a wonderful place. It's you know, it's like you wonder why was he unhappy? Well, I guess because the heating didn't work, something <laughs> like this. And finally here, undated, in Thibault's office. This is one of the countless notebooks in, in Thibault's office. Um, and of course, here's Ulysse. Now, Ulysse has already appeared in previous talk. I would just add to this that, uh, so Ulysse was a gentle dog always lying there, sleeping, dozing, sometimes squinting at us, but that was about it. But at lunchtime, he had this habit of getting up and moving between us and the blackboard to tell us, now, over, <laughs> lunchtime, tea stop time. it. What? At tea, time. <laughs> tea, at tea time. Anyway, so with this note, if Elise was the uh, chairman, I think he would now also move between me and the... So, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one question or two. Yes. Just curiosity. You mentioned this beautiful work of BKL yes. as a classic work of yes. physics. How would you expect uh, the, this Zeno approach to be modified by the quantum? 
or if well, the Zeno, the Zeno, I mean, it's just a choice of a time coordinate, and uh, it's. I, I don't think it's really. It's, it's a convenient choice because, in the original picture, you have the BKL oscillations in the chaotic case take place an infinite number of times. So what this does, it simply stretches this finite interval to infinite time, and then you have a very nice straight description of these oscillations. So I would say, it's. It's uh, it's just a choice of time coordinate, and in you know the wheeler dewitt equation has no time to start with, exactly. and this is the ingenious thing about the wheeler dewitt equation because you can choose the time co or coordinate as you like, but uh, and this is you know this just illustrates the mechanism that's often to to see assume to make this work. Is there another question? Uh, it's the same thing as he said. I, I, I'm not physicist, so I'm just asking uh, because I read this quantum gravity one paper of uh, Dewitt, yes. and he used this as a global condition. So my question is a bit kind of kind of confused because uh, this is a local time, no? It's like uh, it's a local time. It has to do with the fact that you know this is where it connects up to Bernard's conjecture because Bernard said you should see this in the dimension reduction to one dimension. And the BKL is a sort of dynamical realization of that because it says, as you go towards the singularity, the time dependence overwhelms everything else. So it's de facto, effectively, like a dimensional reduction to one dimension. So this, one way to interpret BKL is, is to say that as you approach the space-like singularity, the system sort of decays into a uh, continuous superposition of one-dimensional systems. And this is why I think, you know, uh, you, you start seeing this huge symmetry. And this arrow of time corresponding, it's also local. This is yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, in, in, in quantum gravity, you can pick time coordinate locally as you like. But because here we're sort of starting from uh, compactification to one point, you know, the, the another unsolved problem here is how to excite to get back the spatial dependence from within this huge Lie algebra. We have some idea, we've had lots of ideas actually, but nothing so far has really worked. So, as I said, there's, there's a lot of um, terra incognita here. So let us thank Herman again. <laughs>